Yeah. Sorry about that. And you're live. We are live and we're reconvening. All right. So, uh, as I was saying, the, the path of every storm looks different. Rainfall amounts look different. What debris ends up where can be different. And so, it's often difficult to make exact apples to apples comparisons between events. Uh, but all indications are that the programs and projects undertaken to repair damage following Tropical Storm Irene and improve resiliency perform admirably this summer. Uh, in the coming years, it will be imperative to continue to build on this work and implement programs and projects to both build back better and make proactive investments that enhance resilience. To my mind, uh, this work can really be organized into four broad categories. The first is investing in nature-based solutions. The next is floodproofing and hardening existing infrastructure that needs to remain in vulnerable locations. The third is designing and maintaining reliable infrastructure, uh, not only for current, but also future climate conditions. And then finally, being ready with fast, effective response and recovery. And I'll talk about each one of those in a little bit more detail. Uh, starting with nature-based solutions. The focus here is really on the conservation and restoration of different areas of the landscape. Actions like protecting and restoring wetlands and floodplains, giving rivers more room to spill over their banks without causing catastrophic flooding, as well as conserving strategic large woodland tracts to ensure forests remain forests to both soak away stormwater and protect biodiversity. Importantly, uh, many of these nature-based solutions can really pull double duty in our clean water work. And as a result, uh, we have made significant investments in these types of projects over the last eight years under the umbrella of clean water. Uh, this includes replanting an estimated 328 acres of forested riparian buffers, uh, restoring 109 acres of floodplain, purchasing easements on nearly 1,500 acres of riparian corridors, conserving and restoring more than 1,200 acres of wetlands, and supporting the conservation of some 26,000 acres of land with explicit natural resources protections. Um, an example of this type of work in the developed landscape is the Water Street River Park in Northfield, which is sort of a, a poster child. Uh, flooding along the Dodd River during Tropical Storm Irene damaged 18 homes in this Water Street neighborhood, and the town worked with the affected property owners in FEMA to secure voluntary <laughs> flood buyouts uh, that both helped move those homeowners out of harm's way and allowed the town to acquire and restore uh, five acres of floodplain right outside Northfield's downtown. That five acre area is now known as the Water Street River Park and it has walking paths and community members use it as well as their dogs, um, both to access the river for wading and fishing as well as general recreation. Um, during wet weather events, however, it, it, re, it pulls that double duty as a floodplain and there are great photos. If you haven't seen them, I'm happy to share them around of floodwaters being stored in that park during wet weather events, including that which we experienced earlier this year. As a result, the, pl the park has reduced flood risk and has enhanced the downtown in that neighborhood. In terms of floodproofing or hardening infrastructure, these are changes that are made to eliminate flood damage to buildings, including things like our drinking water and wastewater facilities, which by virtue <laughs> of their uh, operations need to be located uh, close to a river and therefore are impractical to be located in less vulnerable locations. Um, it's also buildings sometimes. Our historic settlement patterns obviously uh, didn't, weren't um, put in place with climate change in mind. And so an example is the investments made in the Waterbury State Office Complex following Tropical Storm Irene. Uh, in the complex, all mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems have been moved from the basement to higher floors. Um, and the basement was then actually built and structurally reinforced with concrete. So that the lowest floor elevation in those historic buildings is now above the 500 level. Uh, as a result, even though the complex is flooding during the July 23 event, it was fully open and operational within two weeks as opposed to the months and <coughs> years following Tropical Storm Irene. The next piece is thinking about infrastructure design decisions, not only with current, but also future climate in mind, and keeping up with need and maintenance of improvements. This is things like ensuring the reliability or removal of the hundreds of dams throughout Vermont, 
uh, as well as replacing undersized bridges and culverts with wider, sometimes referred to as bankful lift structures that in turn limit damage during flood events. Um, one need not look any further than Vermont Route 10107 in the Bethel, Killington, and Stockbridge area. <coughs> Following Irene, these roadways needed to be fully reconstructed, and as part of that work, uh, damaged or destroyed bridges were replaced by new structures with increased waterway openings. Uh, in addition, hundreds of tons of large diameter rock was used to reinforce particularly vulnerable sections <laughs> of the roadway. And although Routes 100 and 107 required temporary closures during ju the July and early August rains due to flooding, the roadways reopened quickly and required relatively modest repairs. And I'm sure Secretary Flynn from the Agency of Transportation can speak about other examples or that one in more detail. And finally, uh, in terms of fast and effective response, it's essential to supporting the safety and well-being of Vermonters in the face of climate change. Uh, some of the best examples, at least in the world I live in, are, seem relatively mundane but are important. Um, things like the established relationships we now have uh, between our river, river engineers, the town road foremen, um, and counterparts <laughs> of the Agency of Transportation, and the fact that we've developed emergency permitting guidelines and can waive public comment periods during a declared state of emergency, allowing us to move quickly to affect repairs. Ultimately, we know we need to continue to work to curb greenhouse gas emissions reductions and invest in programs and projects that will make Vermont more resilient. Uh, the team at ANR, including our Climate Action Office, who's represented here today, helps improve resilience through science-based monitoring and analysis, information sharing, public outreach, and technical assistance, providing grants and cost shares to support the implementation of sustainable and effective projects. We know we can't simply snap our fingers and become resilient. It will require a long-term commitment and a workable plan. Um, this afternoon, you're going to hear from key program leaders here at ANR, as well as our partners at BDM. We'll share more specific information from their vantage points about how we've identified and are working to systematically address impacts from the summer's floods, including issues related to rivers, dam safety, and landslides. Um, and then you're going to hear about ongoing work to further enhance landscape level resilience, the importance of which was further emphasized by the summer's floods, including the hazard mitigation work being led by Vermont Emergency Management and tools being developed by the Climate Action Office that should be ready soon to help Vermont municipalities better proactively identify and address their vulnerabilities. Um, and although there are days where it can certainly seem like a small silver lining as communities continue the hard work of recovery, the impact of the coordination, education, <laughs> planning, and implementation that Vermonters engaged in since I dream was validated during the summer's flooding, reinforcing the value of our approach to improving and enhancing resilience across the Vermont land. Um, and just before maybe having to answer any questions, did want to introduce, we have new leadership within the Department of Environmental Conservation, where a lot of the programs you're going to hear from in a moment uh, are housed and, um, and joined today by Commissioner Jason Batchelder, who may be a familiar face to some, uh, having retired as the Colonel of the Warden Force about two years ago. Uh, and then Deputy Commissioner Heather Pembroke, who is a, a longtime uh, ANRDC employee with background in water quality. And happy to either have them step up and introduce themselves first, answer questions, however you'd like to handle it here, Sheldon. Um, I think in the interest of time, we should go to the next presenter, sure. I think is Commissioner Batchelder. Thanks, Secretary Moore. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone, especially Representative Patton. Knocked on my door personally to ask for my vote, which I, <laughs> I was already given. I was, I was um, but thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for your service to Vermont, especially during these, these tumultuous times that um, affect uh, all our corners and um, and boundaries, and uh, it seems to be closer every day. Um, my name is Jason Batchelder. I'm the new commissioner of Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, you're surrounded by, um, at least on one side, some of our extraordinary team. I have a huge team, which I'm not accustomed to yet. I um, was the, the director of the Warden Service, which was a wonderful career. And I'm so thankful to have been called upon by the secretary and the governor to step into this new role. Um, 
I want to read an excerpt uh, from an uh, email I sent to my staff. I'll, I'll be I'll be quick. I promise, um, Madam Chair, and get to a couple of my priorities. Then I'm going to turn it over. Um, but I get asked a lot to what, what brought me here. I came from a world of, of, of criminal law enforcement, and and now I'm in um, a much more dynamic and, and fast moving world, which I never expected. But uh, what has brought me here, and which I love to talk about, and hope to be invited here to continue to do so because I feel it's relevant. Um, in short, it's a connection to Vermont and to public service that we all share. Um, we also share our vocation to career paths, which can be said in another way, um, and, and extraordinarily relevant to my team here. We all likely wanted to do what we're doing now since we knew that we needed to do something. My connection to the outdoors comes largely from a drive to fish and hunt and to gather my food. I love food from literally anywhere on the planet, but I really love to punctuate my pursuits with really great food. Uh, related to this job, I'm not going to eat it or feed it to my children uh, if it's not safe and sustainable at all levels. Most Vermonters share similar values in one shape or another, and ensuring they can continue to live in, on, with the land, clean air and clean water, which they depend on, is a great way to serve them. And that's essentially why I'm here. Um, in and among those, I'm, um, some priorities are emerging for me, and if you'll indulge me, um, certainly flood resilience and recovery is, is high on that list. Um, hardening of infrastructure, which, which affects more than just the DC, um, but certainly relevant to this committee, and I appreciate um, your, your forward-looking attention to it already. Um, PCBs and PFAS and emerging contaminants are, are right there as well, and seems to be, uh, if, if we're not looking at flood recovery and resilience, we're looking at, at contaminants. Um, you'll likely hear and see and, and uh, feel these pressures as much as we do, and, and many of you are likely more steeped in the knowledge of them than, than I am and, and likely ever will be. My subject matter expertise is, is not there yet, but it's, it's growing by the day. Um, and certainly a look at our internal processes is a, is a priority for me, and to not be in the way of, of the governor's um, attempt to solve our housing crisis. Everyone's attempt to solve our housing crisis, right? I, I certainly don't want to be in any way an impediment to that through any processes that we might have. I know that's, that's probably a bigger ask than I'll ever be able to achieve. Um, but I'm, I'm anxious to get started. I'm happy to be here, and I, I, I would probably not have time for any questions, but I'm happy to take any, and, and thank you for, for having us here today. Um, I don't believe um, Deputy Commissioner Pembroke is going to say anything. She's welcome to introduce herself. Um, but then I, I believe, um, are, are we in, in order? No, I think Ben. Yeah. I think Ben. Is oh, certainly. Um, ben Young is going to be next. He's our, he's our state geologist and the director of the geology program. Um, he is joining us uh, remotely today, and I, and I hope that's set up. Um, again, thank you. Um, I'm going to move over here, but I'm happy to chat. Uh, he should be here for the duration. So thank you very much. Oh, Ben Green is next on our agenda. Okay. No problem. No problem. We've got a we've got a few minutes. Yeah, I have some printouts of my presentation. And we have them posted on the, our web page too. Okay. Um, record, my name is. Uh, Ben Green, I'm the uh, section chief of the Dam Safety Program in the Department of Environmental Conservation. I thank you very much for the invitation to come and, and speak to you today about dams and dam safety and how the July flooding event, as well as a small event in December, impacted uh, our program in dams in Vermont. Um, this image uh, here on the color cover photo is a aerial image of Waterbury Dam, which is the largest um, state owned dam and um, still, uh, still, still owned and operated by our department to this day. I want to start with just a brief overview of the history of dams and dam safety in Vermont, kind of hit some of the main high points. 
Um, interestingly, Vermont was actually the first uh, state in the nation to enact the NCAA legislation in 1876. Uh, it's kind of neat to think that we were the first there. Um, this was done in response to the mill dam failure in Massachusetts, which is still the deadliest dam failure in New England history with 139 lives uh, claimed. Um, another notable thing in, in uh, Vermont history is the 1927 flood, which I imagine you've heard quite a bit about. Um, it's a flood of record in Vermont, and during the event, many dams failed. Before the eight, reportedly, 84 lives were lost, likely due to both dam failures and just general flooding. And it also resulted in the design and construction of the three Winnipeg River flood control dams, for which my program is responsible uh, for today. Okay. Moving along in the timeline, in the 1950s and 60s, was a, a time of dam building in the state. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers built uh, flood control dams in the Connecticut Valley, and also the, the uh, Soil Conservation Service had a dam building program where many farmers built <coughs> farm ponds at that time at that dam. Um, fast forwarding to 2011 was uh, Tropical Storm Irene, which I'm sure we all remember. Uh, it was a major flood and we we're all very fortunate not to have any major dam failures during that event. Um, in 2018, uh, our program was given rulemaking authority for the first time. We historically had very limited authorities to enact uh, the dam safety in the state and this uh, allowed us to play catch up with federal standards standards of other, other states. And in July 2023, of course, we had this major flood event um, that resulted in the failure of reaching a five regulated dams the overtop and the overtopping of 50 dams and not even include on the timeline was the small flood we had right before Christmas. Um, an interesting fact, as of 1900, our records in our program indicate there's been approximately 75 dam failures in the state of Vermont. Um, now for just a brief program overview, we're located in the Water Investment Division. Our, our mission statement is listed here. We have two primary responsibilities, uh, dam regulation of non-hydropower, non-federal dams, and as well as uh, state dam ownership of 14 uh, dams, including the three ministries. <coughs> Our current staffing is five. We have, um, uh, we have two licensed engineers, uh, myself in one limited service position. We have two staff no, engineers are not with one limited service position, and right now we have a project that us with remaining work. Um, under our uh, legislation, so under our regulatory side, uh, we, have, we work under 10 BSA Chapter 43 <coughs> dams. Again, that's limited to non-federal, non-power dams. And we also have the ownership piece, which is, as I mentioned, 14 dams we're responsible for. Um, next, I just wanted to briefly review uh, how dams are classified relative to the potential for losses downstream that they have in the event of the dam failure or dam incidents. And that's through what's called hazard potential. And uh, the state uses a system of four, uh, four hazard potentials. And this is in line with the National Inventory of Dams and other federal programs. They are high, significant, low, and minimal. So each dam in the state has a classification of one of those. A high hazard dam is one in the event of an incident or a dam failure that's probably probable to be result in loss of life, down to a low hazard dam or a minimal hazard dam, which is in the event of a dam failure, um, losses would be pretty limited. Um, a couple of things to note about uh, hazard potential classification is that it's a dynamic classification. It can change in time, it can change with downstream development, and other factors, and also it's independent of condition. So you can have a dam that's not in very good condition, doesn't have very much down, downstream of it, so it's maybe a low hazard dam as opposed to, it's all about what's really what's downstream of the dam, not the condition of the dam itself. Uh, my program is also responsible, responsible for maintaining a Vermont dam inventory, which is developed by our predecessors. Uh, and it's been updated uh, since to a web-based uh, format. Um, you can see the number of records here. It's broken up here just by the number of dams per regulatory entity in the state. Uh, the DEC, from whom I work, regulate roughly 1,000 dams. Public Utility Commission regulates roughly 20 dams. Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, roughly 80. And then uh, federal dams are self-regulated. So those are dams owned by the Army Corps of Engineers, National Park Service, et cetera. Dive a little bit more into the inventory of dams. Um, the chart in the upper left shows the purposes of dams in the state. Roughly 60% of the dams in the state are, have a primary purpose of recreation. Um, conversely, less than 1% of dams have a primary purpose of flood control. So while many dams do provide some, uh, some measurable benefit of flood control, there's only a very small number that's their primary purpose and that that's their main function. Um, in the upper right is dam hazard potential classification. If you look at the orange, and red um, pies, pies in the upper right of that chart. Um, you can see that roughly 30% of Vermont dams are higher significant hazard. This is a number that's actually increasing as time goes by as we use modern techniques to evaluate the hazard potential classification of these dams. And um, 
as well as uh, increased downstream development of dams. Uh, in the lower left is Vermont uh, dam age, and from this chart you can see that over 80 percent, or over, uh, excuse me, over 80 percent of Vermont dams are over uh, 50 years of age. Uh, with a typical design life of most dams of 50 years, it's just an indicator that the inventory as a whole is aging, which by New England standards is, 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 is not uncommon. But it does show us the age of our inventory. And then in the lower uh, right is ownership type. Um, it may seem surprising to many folks, but actually 60% of our dams are privately owned. Um, so dams on even minor and major water courses can in fact be privately owned. At the federal level, that number is roughly 65%. So we're, we're, we're sort of in line with what the national average is. Um, conversely, uh, roughly 15% of dams in the state are state owned with the Agency of Natural Resources uh, owning 100 of those dams, the majority of them. And that's of course made up between DEC, FPR, and Fish and Wildlife. I want to just briefly go through a couple key initiatives that we have on each side of our of our work. First, our regulatory key initiative is the rulemaking that we're, that we're working on that has um, been going on since 2018. Historically, the program has had very limited authorities. For example, our inspection program was voluntary to dam owners, and we did not historically have the authority to compel owners to make dam safety improvements. Um, so th this, this rulemaking really is a paradigm shift into a more active and proactive uh, regulatory style uh, for, for regulating dams in the state. And um, it's, it's, phase, it's been adopted in phases. Phase one was adopted in 2020, and phase two uh, is hopefully be in place in 2025. And it will certainly make it much more proactive in terms of dam safety regulations. We will have the authority to require owners to, to take proper measures to maintain their dams in good condition. On the uh, ownership side, one of our key initiatives is, is the Waterbury Dam Spillway Replacement Project. This is a project we've been working on for, for many years with the District of the Army Corps of Engineers. It's been uh, estimated to be a 70 to $100 million project. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's, you know, it, it started in the early 2000s when um, concrete issues at the dam uh, caused gate jamming. And uh, since then, it's been determined that the floodgates of Waterbury are only safely capable of handling 75% of their design flood load. So this project, which is you know, right now in the uh, pre-design phase, we move into design and construction, hopefully in the 2027 and 2028 timeframe, it will basically restore full functionality to uh, Waterbury, our largest flood control dam and largest state-owned dam. And I'd like to shift gears a little bit and just focus on the July 2023 flood event. Perhaps you've seen this, this figure. This was developed by the National Weather Service. Um, it shows the rainfall totals from the July event, um, largely focused along the spine of the Green Mountains with um, Calais, Vermont, having 9.2 inches, the greatest amount of rainfall, and generally 4 to 8 being pretty common rainfall amounts uh, measured. Of course, it resulted in the declaration of a state emergency and federal declaration that had a quite an impact on our, in our inventory, as well as our ownership portfolio. Um, I'd like to first to start by talking about the Winooski River flood control dams. Um, how they're our highest risk asset and how they perform. Um, Riceville made national news. It's located just up the road here and protects Montpelier. Um, Essentially, we had a we, the entirety of that reservoir, uh, flood storage reservoir was full. And we had a first pool of record, meaning it was the highest pool that that reservoir has seen since the dam was constructed in the 1930s. We were just 10 inches from uh, having water flow over the auxiliary spillway, which by itself is not a dam safety, a huge dam safety concern uh, or issue, but would have resulted in more water going downstream. I have a subsequent slide where I'll talk a little bit more about specifics of what really happened at Wrightsville and how it performed. Um, and the other one, the other two dams that we have, East Barry, uh, was also a pool of record. We had a bit more breathing room there. We were roughly 12 feet from the spillway there. Um, not to say we weren't sweating a little bit, but we had a little bit more breathing room. And then Waterbury, we were roughly six and a half feet below our action level in the fourth pool of record there. So the, the three flood control dams performed well, but we saw a lot of their flood capacity used up during this event. And, um, for sure. So also during the event, in terms of these facilities for continual storm, uh, storm and dam monitoring, including round the clock monitoring of Waterbury and Wrightsville. Um, we did on the fly inundation mapping and emergency coordination of the towns downstream of Waterbury, Wrightsville, and Eastbury. We also did some a lot of inspection work associated with the dams, including uh, post event tunnel inspections at Wrightsville and Eastbury, where we did find some minor damage sustained by the tunnel at Wrightsville due to the flood event, um, as well as working with the Army Corps to study how the how uh, Wrightsville and Eastbury uh, survived the, the events and how we could maybe make some uh, eventual changes to those dams, maybe make them perform better. 
Uh, this, this, this slide is we'll focused on the performance of Riceville Dam during the event. Had a lot of, this dam was by far the one that was filled the most and the highest, uh, highest concern during the event. Um, and uh, this figure here, this cartoonish figure, is a cross section of, of Riceville Dam just to kind of show you how the dam is designed to work. It's called a self regulating flood control dam. Um, on the left side of this image is the upstream side where we see the water, on the downstream side is to the right. And, and um, the way to uh, water typically passes through the site is the hat structure in the left side of the image it is located at normal pool or at the principal spillway level. Water typically drops into that vertical shaft and passes through the dam uh, through the tunnel that goes through the foundation of the dam. And then above that, you can see the red arrows and a 50 foot flood storage band. We have 50 foot of available flood storage in that reservoir up to the auxiliary spillway. Essentially during this event, we used up 49 and a half feet of that. Uh, we were very fortunate we didn't go higher. Um, the issue largely being, we still have lots of a free board or available capacity above that from a dam safety perspective, but we would have started to discharge water downstream, a few feet of which but it could have resulted in what we call non-failure consequences, which would just be additional flooding caused downstream that could have impacted property and homes and things like that. Um, the figure in the lower right just shows um, the water level over time during this flood event. You can see it was 20, this reservoir was 20 days at an elevated pool, which is a little bit longer than ideal. You can see the very beginning, we kind of had some up and downs. We were fortunate not to have a back-to-back -back storm event during that period because we were not drawing down very quickly just to the way that it gets configured. We have no ability to uh, uh, operate gates or, or have it. This is largely a self-regulating facility. So we, we, our hands are a bit tied in terms of getting the water down more quickly. And that's one of the things we're looking at with the core is if there is a way to make some modifications here to improve on that performance. Yeah. Having a technology day. <clears throat> oh, there it goes. Um, just to do a brief overview of how ANR dams uh, performed during the event, of our 14 dams, uh, three sustained some level of minor damage. Uh, Noise Pond Dam took some minor damage on the spillway that was repaired. Um, Waterbury Dam, as I mentioned, has the existing issues with the gate that we're working with the core on, and also doing a, a temporary project to help improve that in the short term uh, until we can do the larger project. And also Wrightsville, uh, we understand there were some issues with the tunnels and other things. Uh, from our FPR's uh, own dam standpoint, five of the 15 dams took minor damage, but overall performed well. And then for fish and wildlife owned dams, 17 of the 76 uh, sustained some level of minor damage, but again, overall performed well, with the exception being Gale Meadows Dam, uh, which uh, activated its auxiliary spillway. And this image in the lower right shows the head cutting that occurred as the once the flows uh, receded, uh, a lot of head cutting that occurred there, and erosion that could have gone much further back, it could have caused a uh, uncontrolled release of the reservoir. That's subsequently been repaired, and that was just completed uh, last week. Uh, on the regulatory side, uh, the first few days after the flood were largely spent um, at our flood control facilities and chasing down some, 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 some fire drills at some of the regulated dams. Uh, once we were able to get our bearings, uh, we pulled together a rapid inspection program. We used emergency management assistance compact, uh, getting in staff from the New York Power Authority, New York Dam Safety, and Mass Dam Safety to perform roughly 390 dam inspections across the state over the following two weeks. That's helped us to categorize which dams took damage, which did not, and then really focus on the highest risk in areas and the dams took the most damage from the event. Um, from this, we performed our follow up inspections, roughly 65 <laughs> on dams that did that, 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 that take us. Uh, damage during the event that needed, needed additional work. Um, and from the events, uh, we had five dams that breached or failed, two significant hazard dams and three low hazard dams. And thankfully we had no high hazard dams that failed. And this next few slides have some images of a few of the dams that failed. Hans Mill Dam in Washington failed. Um, it was unfortunately slated for removal next year and it, it, it beat it by a year. Um, moving on, uh, these are some of their dams that failed. Quinn Lower Dam in Wallingford, Clark Sawmill Dam in Cabot. Lions Dam in Peru, and then Dow Pond Dam in Middlebury actually did not technically fail, and they didn't release the reservoir in a controlled way, but it nearly did. Thankfully, the trans was, was there to kind of save the day on, on that, that facility. Um, so uh, from, from there, we've been working on roughly 50 of these dams uh, that were damaged during the event, doing things like uh, increased emergency action planning, working through owners, for the owners to do temporary repairs, uh, increased monitoring and risk reduction measures. And uh, at this point, cursory cost estimates of the damage 
these are very cursory based on the work we've done so far. You know, the storm maintenance, roughly at six hundred thousand dollars, is how much it's going to take to get things back into play. Uh, temporary stabilization, one million, and then the dams that were damaged during the event up to full compliance. Uh, to be a fully compliant safe dam, roughly sixty million. Again, these are these are very very early estimates yet. Um, and then I, I believe I think I'm at time, but I just want to quickly review this most recent storm event that we had. Um, overall, our dams luckily performed very well. That includes our dams and our own dams, as well as our regulated base. It was a snow and rain event, um, which is difficult to predict, and. Um, you know, thankfully, uh, everything performed pretty well. Areas with the highest snowpack were really the areas that were most in fact, in, impacted. And I just want to note, I think most notable thing here is that Waterbury Reservoir actually got within got within four inches of the level we were in July. And um, it's interesting that in 2023, the fourth and sixth highest pools in, 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 in facility history happened. <coughs> and then in the last 12 years, we've had the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. So um, we're seeing a lot more floods at that facility than or they have over history. That's, that's what I have. Yeah, I bet we have questions for you. Um, and I see Representative Burke. Go ahead. Did you have your hand up? I do. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, well, a couple of things. One is that, you know, we heard a lot about the Wrightsfield, Wrightsfield Dam. Is there any way to increase capacity of that dam, given the predictions for, you know, more and more rain, rain events? And then the other question was, interest heard that program about the floodplain in Waterbury that the state was trying to acquire a family who didn't want to sell. So I just wondered what the status of that was. Um, I, can't, I can't speak to the floodplain issue in Waterbury. Um, that's outside my purview, perhaps one of the colleagues can. And Wrightsville, I would say increasing capacity, while it would be nice to do, I think it would be challenging <laughs> acquiring more land. Um, we own, the state owns the quote unquote flowage rights uh, up, to the, up to the spillway and to the dam crest, but we don't own land on that. So if we were to increase the capacity, we'd have to acquire additional lands. Um, and uh, one thing to consider is that whenever you increase the capacity of a dam, you also in a way increase the risk because now you're rolling back even more water. Um, you know, I think there's opportunities at Riceville to uh, add some functional, uh, some opera operational capacity that we don't currently have that would have been helpful pre, during, and post flood that would have uh, improved the system's <laughs> performance, provide us a little bit more uh, breathing from there. I think that's probably where the where the our money's best spent, but we're, we're we're engaging with the court to look at that, and I don't think I think we'll only make rocks unturned. Right. Thank you. Okay. One more, and then we have to move on. Representative Pat. Uh, thank you. I'm very familiar with uh, Wrightsville because I live just upstream from there, but also from an energy perspective, I'm curious how many of the dams have hydro generation. R roughly 100 uh, dams in the state have, have hydro, roughly 80 regulated by FERC and roughly 20 by Public Utility Commission. The rest are uh, essentially on power. I, I am familiar that in, in, in times like this when there's very high water, the hydro plant at Wrightsville has to shut down it's because right. to run that much water through the turbines would blow the turbines apart. So. Thank you for your testimony and for your work on behalf of Vermonters. And can you just briefly tell us how many people are in your section? Uh, right now we have a total of five. <clears throat> five. Okay. And I bet you all were on um, overtime significantly in July. So thank, yes. thank you very much for that. Thanks. I think now we have Ben DeYoung. DeYoung? Uh, via. That's correct. Sorry. Um, Thank you. Um, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna try to start sharing my screen. <clears throat> and can I just ask? Do you see this in presentation mode on your end? Uh, we yeah. see uh, not quite. We're seeing kind of the big slide and the small slide. We're seeing the notes, slide yeah. The small slide. Okay. Let me um try to undo that then. How about that? Is that better? No, oh, we still see your notes oh, slide. Sorry, Next sorry. slide. How about that? Yeah, that got it. Beautiful. I'm going to bring a laser pointer into view. Can you see that moving around? We can. Lovely. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having us today and for the opportunity to speak with you. I'm, I'm very disappointed I can't be with you in person, but I'm equally happy that I tested um, and found out that I do have COVID and that I'm not a super spreader right when you guys least need that. 
<laughs> Thank okay. you for that. For, for bearing with me right now online, I'll try to be as clear as I can and hope that the electrons are moving quickly. So um, I am Ben DeYoung. I'm the, the Vermont State Geologist and the Director of the Vermont Geological yeah. Survey. Um, I am going to be speaking about the summer that we just experienced more from the perspective of our, our hillsides um, and specifically uh, speaking to the landslides that we all heard about um, plenty in the media. Um, <clears throat> I work with uh, just two other people in my division. Since, since we're so small, I, I wanted to take the opportunity to introduce ourselves to you. So it is myself as director I work closely with John Kim, who has been with us uh, since the mid 90s. And then also with Dr. Peter Strand, who joined us in our limited service position on July 17. So um, putting that on our timeline, Dr. Strand had quite a, a, an onboarding experience and um, jumped right in with both feet. And in fact, came up to speed quickly and and got licensed with the FAA to fly this drone to give us some aerial perspective on some of these hazards, um, which was just fantastic. So um, <laughs> before I jump right into the actual landslides, I wanted to quickly um, speak a bit to the storm. Does this animate on your end? Can you see this yes. moving? It does, Beautiful. yeah. Okay, so this is uh, just simple you know, radar showing how this storm propagated and it came up from the Southwest and these Southwest uh, move, moving storms tend to be flowing over very warm and humid air. And so they can carry more moisture along with them. And you can see it moving kind of unhindered up this direction until we come into Vermont, right about in here, you start to see a disturbance and the storm kind of breaks up and then and kind of circu circulates over Vermont for an extended period of time. Okay, this is what caused our really high precipitation amounts over Vermont. There was a high pressure system up into Canada that was essentially blocking this, by the way. And the best way that I have heard this storm um, described is as a juicer. So as this thing was moving to the north, and then it was essentially blocked and circulating over Vermont, it was encountering what we are, are so lovingly see here along most of the state are green mountains. And so those green mountains were st sticking up as promontories and essentially juicing that storm and squeezing the moisture and the, and the precipitation out of that storm. And that fell over just as Ben Green just shared with you, it, sh it, it dropped principally over the green mountains and almost had something like a reverse orographic effect where it mostly fell on the eastern flank of the green mountains. And so this rendering on the right is very similar to what Ben showed you that the National Weather Service produced. This one was produced by our partner, George Springston at Norwich University. And it just interpolates from each of these weather um, rain gauges rather here, um, what that precipitation looked like over the state. And sure enough, it really, our greatest rain amounts were right to the east of and over the spine of the Green Mountain. So I'm gonna take that same visual and on the next slide, I'm gonna show you where we had requests to visit based on landslide hazards. And just as you might've imagined, um, those locations highlighted at the scale of a town in bold were right in those pockets where we received the greatest amounts of precipitation. So that rain fell from July 9 to 11. On July 12th, I emailed my boss, then Commissioner John Beeling, and um, tried to, to just plant the seed that we might start to see some landslides. And I said, all, you know, all attention has, has understandably been in our flooded uh, areas in the state, but that starting today, this will begin pivoting to the hills and adjacent areas experiencing erosion and landslide hazards. And so I asked that he just let me know if he hears about these things. At the time, I thought perhaps we'd see, you know, five or six landslides. I had no clue that this was gonna kick off two months of, of um, pretty significant effort from my division. So um, by the numbers, uh, I have 81 sites that we were requested to go visit. Um, these are ones that did pose some significant hazards. We had 
uh, quite a few other sites that turned out to not be hazardous and folks just wanted another eye on it. So um, we responded to quite a few and we recognized very early on that we needed a very effective way to communicate these hazards in order to, um, as Secretary Moore said, to ensure a fast and effective response. So we stood up a categorization schema for these, um, kind of like our dam, uh, one through four, where a one would recognize that, yes, a significant um, landslide had occurred or, or, um, or there was signs of incipient sliding, but that there was no further immediate risk or action required. So in this case, this is an example from Wolcott, where this person did experience quite a landslide on their property. However, upon inspection above and adjacent to this surface, which happened to have been a spring, um, we didn't see any additional hazards. And so we told that individual they could continue to use their house and in fact, start doing some cleanup efforts. If we still saw signs that something was, uh, was unstable, um, that would be elevated to a two. And these are those sites where we suggested that either ongoing monitoring was required or some sort of a mitigation strategy to fix those slopes. Um, not necessarily a hazard that required um, um, evacuation, um, but certainly some more attention needed. If something was labeled a three, um, upon our first inspection, we were asked by Secretary Moore to not allow it to remain a three. A three would, would suggest that it is still unstable and it needs to be evaluated by state fire and safety to see if that um, parcel or any structures improvements on it need to be evacuated. So when we saw something and, and said, okay, this needs to be evaluated immediately by state fire and safety, we would either uh, invite them in and, um, and, and elevate that to a four and evacuate the, the, the structure, or we would identify some sort of a mitigation or a monitoring strategy and reduce that to a two. And then of course, the, the worst case scenario are those that had failed or showed very obvious signs of incipient failure, where we would ask folks to uh, get out of the, any structures on site and the local fire safety officials would uh, put a red tag on those facilities. So by the numbers, again, we've been to, this, this number is actually out of date. Again, it keeps changing because we get more requests. I think it is now 82, but by the numbers, the lion's share of these are, 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 are ones, which is a good thing. We have mostly sites where we have identified no additional hazards or risks associated. However, we do still have quite a few twos that we have already identified as being unstable. The owners know that there is still some lingering instability and that uh, more mitigation or mo more, more monitoring or mitigation is needed. We've also had 11 facilities now that um, have been a four. So, so eight of those are residential structures where we are supporting with a, a buyout through a FEMA program working with our partners at Vermont Emergency Management. So um, what we have learned is that in order for us to respond um, with any sort of um, speed, right, fast and efficient response, we really needed to increase our coordination <laughs> efforts. We, again, are only a team of three, and we have no dedicated staff to this sort of work. We don't have a hazards division. Um, like some other state geological surveys have. So this in, sort of in order here started with first very closely working with the State Emergency Operations Center. I was up very early in the mornings, understanding what requests came in overnight and, and communicating our plan for the day for visiting um, sites. And then again, um, late evening to recap what we had found during our site visits and then queuing up our, our site visits for the next day. Um, it also, um, we, we were very fortunate to work right from the get-go with our university partner at Norwich, uh, George Springston, who is uh, undoubtedly one of the state's most premier landslide experts. He has assembled an inventory of landslides around the state, and, and there are over 3,000 of those. 
um, that we have inventory. <clears throat> so this is not a new thing. The magnitude certainly is new. We were also able to deputize, so to speak, two prior Vermont Geological Survey staff members back in. These folks had been in our limited service position in the past and they had moved on to other um, state programs for, for, um, for uh, permanent positions, but they could hit the ground running so that we could have multiple teams going different directions, which was a huge advantage for us after only having uh, yeah, essentially one, one car for some time. Uh, we also worked yeah, much I mean, more closely. I was going to ask if they need the whole time. First, with um, VTrans, we were able to get some geotechnical yeah. assistance yeah. from VTrans. We also yeah. were able to borrow some structural engineering support yeah. from the yeah. urban search and rescue team. Okay. And then we were working closely as well with the Department yeah. of Public Don't worry about it. We'll stop. Uh, VEM. Yeah, I just want to Yeah, well, I don't think she has enough time. Um, and like Ben Green and the dam safety yeah. program, we were able to enact a, an emergency yeah. management assistance yeah. compact yeah. request to bring in four geotechnical staff from the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation to revisit 24 sites that we had. Um, essentially, they were in that category of two, and we were trying to understand the time frame of the, uh, the lingering hazards at some of these sites. <clears throat> um, so, so again, just to reiterate Secretary Moore's messaging here, uh, enabled this coordination that we stood up enabled our faster and more effective response. And we are trying to institutionalize this as a, um, a landslide task force going forward to make sure that um, if and when this happens again, we'll be better prepared. Um, and I just wanna quickly uh, highlight for folks what fast and effective means to us. And I'm gonna use this case study in Barry, Vermont, where, um, this view here shows a walking path. This was formerly a rail bed used for the granite industry. Uh, it is now just an informal walking path that's maintained by local residents. This is what it looked like in June of 2023. On uh, the 11th, so right as the sun is starting to come out again over Vermont, we start to see this feature forming right on, on the surface of this walking path. An hour and a half later, that feature looks like this. And by, by, you know, another hour after that, it failed. And so these two um, photographs on the lower part of this image show what this looks like uh, after a rotational landslide failure. You can see the, the head scarp right here, which starts as one of these. These are called tension cracks. It shows that the slope is in tension, pulling away. Um, when we hear from, from folks that a tension crack has formed, we operate under the assumption that it's going to fail quickly as this one did. So when we say fast and effective, we'd really like to be able to respond within the day, not within um, the week or, or certainly not two weeks. Um, I just wanna quickly throw in here that this is not something I think is a, 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 a one-off. I think this is something we can plan on happening. Again, hopefully not to this magnitude, but it's certainly possible. And the, the NOAA puts out these climate summaries for states. Uh, this is from 2022 for Vermont. They put out these key messages. And I've read these messages many, many times. I've included them in presentations, but it wasn't until the storm event that I realized just how related these key messages are. So <clears throat> key message number one, temperatures have risen three degrees Fahrenheit since the beginning of the 20th century. Warmer air carries more water. Annual average precipitation has increased nearly six inches since the 1960s. That's a lot of water. That's a lot of water on our landscape and on our infrastructure. But then key message number three really pulls all of these together. Extreme weather events, particularly floods and severe storms are having a stronger impact on Vermont. <clears throat> At the same time, multi-year meteorological and hydrological droughts continue to pose challenges for water dependent sectors. Typically in July, that is what I am heavily focused on, is helping support some of our municipalities find enough water to supply their constituents. Particularly in the Northeast Kingdom, we have several different municipalities we are supporting and trying to find groundwater resources. So we tend to be um, in, this, in this world of extremes right now where it's, it's feast or famine, right? That last comment there, extreme rainfall events are projected to become more frequent and intense in the future. I think we're seeing that. 
And I think that we uh, we haven't seen this magnitude. I know for a fact we have not seen this magnitude of landsliding in the past. And this may just be a sign of what's to come. So to quickly summarize for you folks, first of all, this really was historic. I, I've been um, sort of referring to this as the 1927 flood of landslides. I think this is the one we're going to be measuring future events against. Um, and it really did expose the, our susceptibility to these things. Um, for us to be responsive requires, first of all, capacity. Uh, again, just reiterating, we are a survey of three with no dedicated staff to geologic hazards. Um, in order to do this then, uh, again, requires this very close coordination and working with geologists, geotechnical and structural engineers and um, Department of Public Safety folks to make sure that we bring the right expertise to bear um, as Vermonters need it. Um, and then I added this third bullet here, well-defined roles and responsibilities. You know, we we became the go-to folks for landslides and, and we're almost operating as first responders for folks. And as such, there was almost like a degree of imprinting that went on. And so when we responded to folks and, and I gave them my card, for example, they would call for um, pretty much any questions they had after that time. And, and some of this is outside of my lane. Um, and I'm, I'm not necessarily the right person to go to for support with FEMA and, and, and things like that. So as we stand up this landslide task force, we're trying to better define what we can do and what we cannot do for folks. Um, when I think about our challenges ahead, I, I kind of put them into the two biggest here, two biggest buckets. One, how do you handle those hazardous parcels that are not eligible for FEMA support. All those twos that I referred to earlier, we have now been to these parcels. We have identified hazards and um, the owners now know that there is still some instability associated with their properties. And they have a lot of, of um, concern, understandably. Um, but now how, how do we go forward from there? And how do we identify resources for these folks? And then number two, you know, we, Ultimately, the question is going to become, well, what do we do about this? Uh, and I think, like any problem, the first thing we have to do is really understand it and identify where we do have the susceptibility. And then we need to manage that information, right? Once we know, what, once we can map out and model where we have landslide susceptibility, we have to use that information carefully. Um, some folks might not like a map that shows their parcel lighting up on a on a susceptible domain. And we need to be sure that we are, are both protective of human health and property, but also protective of, of people's um, properties and assets there too. So I think, I think that's it. And I got through the whole thing without coughing, which is amazing. Uh, I don't know if I have time for questions or not, but I'm happy to take them if I do. Thank you for your presentation. Um, and the same acknowledgement for you and your team for serving Vermont during this uh, incredible event that we had. Actually, I need to check in with ANR. Uh, we are seeming to run out of time. I have three other people scheduled from the uh, ANR and BEM, and really we should be wrapping up by 3.15 to be respectful to the next witnesses. Um, so we may need to reschedule with some of you, and I will perhaps leave it to you to Yes, ma'am. What do you have at 315? It's, it's not a continuation through our plan. We have, we have the Agency of Transportation joining okay. us. I guess our options are to take two and a half minutes apiece or we can prioritize here. I think we should prioritize. Yeah. I would suggest we do uh, Rob Evans next and then we may have to reschedule the next two witnesses. Okay. We'll do um, that. Yeah. Okay, great. You up the text there? Right. My screen okay? We right. um, thank you, Madam Chairs and Committee, for having me in today. I'm Rob Evans. I manage the Rivers Program in the NRDEC Watershed Management. 
today to talk about the regulatory and technical assistance work my program does with respect to resilience. For starters, and bear with me, it'll be quick, but we need to go in the Wayback Machine um, to look at what this General Assembly folks before you were considering after the floods of the 1990s um, in similar positions you all, wondering what the path forward is given the, the widespread destruction. Um, the post-mortem report, uh, the Act 137 report of 1999 <laughs> with myriad findings. Um, but an important one set in motion um, the programs I'm going to talk about today. Um, so it's really important to start there. And really, it was understanding at that time that flood-related erosion was a primary mode of flood damage for us, not just flood inundation. Dynamic rivers and stable rivers were a widespread problem. We still have rivers recovering today from a legacy of dredging, burning, straightening, and armoring, broadly under the bucket or umbrella of channelization practices, something that we've done for decades and decades after every flood. Take the channel deeper, keep more flood water in the channel, and send it downstream faster. That's not flood recovery, that's not flood resilience, it's a recipe for repeated disasters, and that's what we've experienced. And that's what the Act 137 report summarized. When we dredge rivers, we keep more water in the channel. Rivers then erode downward or vertically further with larger flood flows. So we have larger floods contained with the channel. The river starts to widen as it wants to meander and flatten its slope and reconnect to floodplain. That is a destructive river system. This is a great slide from my colleague at the Nature Conservancy, Shane Jaquith. It really shows the distinction between what we want, which is that top cross section there, which is rivers being able to access their floodplains. They should do that during the one to two year flood or the mean annual flood. That's a river's pressure relief valve, where a river can get out onto the floodplain, spread out, slow down, store flood waters, deposit sediment, <clears throat> and debris, versus what you see in the bottom cross section, which is a dugout channelized river. There's nothing slowing that water down usually associated with that deep channel as a steepened channel. And that is what has caused and continues to cause in a lot of reaches of river tremendous destruction to human investments, private and public alike. In the early 2000s, as my program was created, it didn't exist in the 1990s, but it was created in the late 90s um, with both federal hazard mitigation funding from FEMA, as well as Clean water funding from the state. Some of you may, may remember the Clean and Clear program. With those funding sources um, and partners, consultants, and, and, and regional planning commissions, we endeavored to, to assess the physical condition of thousands of miles of Vermont River. And it put a finer point on what we thought we already knew, which was 75% of our rivers assessed were disconnected from the floodplains. The term you see up there on the slide is in size. That means energized. That means disconnected and not accessing the floodplain in a way that we'd like them to. And this, this data set really set in motion further decisions and evolution of programs I'm going to talk about here. So first, let's talk about uh, one of my regulatory programs, the Stream Alteration Permitting Program. That's in-stream work activities within the river channel. Act 110 in 2010 changed the jurisdiction jurisdictional trigger um, significantly, six-fold increase in stream miles regulated. Now we regulate all perennial stream miles, which are the majority in Vermont. So that was significant. Second, uh, session after Irene 2012, Act 138, provided us a much needed emergency authority. We had no ability to limit dredging and flood recovery work in river channels. No or enforcement um, ability to deal with that. And there was significant overworking and over dredging of our streams after I think close to 80 miles of river, but in a more dangerous situation ahead of the most flood. So that was significant to get that authority um, that we now have. And some, some stats from this most recent flood. As a result, we have issued over, well, specifically, I checked this morning from the database, 330 emergency protective and next flood measure authorizations. 
But here's the thing that I want everyone to appreciate. A lot of those authorizations are for dredging and armoring, but it's the minimum necessary to protect human investments in <clears throat> to put channel capacity back to pre-flood conditions so plants aren't threatened, to open up channels uh, a stream of bridges and culverts so they can flow through again. The minimum necessary, as opposed to indiscriminate miles of grid. That image you see right there is after Irene. It's a National Guardsman under orders, almost underwater. Um, dangerous for him and creating more dangerous river. Well-intentioned, but not in <clears throat> recovery. Another significant um, milestone that we hit uh, after Irene, it's a years long process, um, attached to the hip with VTRANS and Vermont Emergency Management, was a negotiation with FEMA to get them to approve and acknowledge our stream alteration rule as codes and standards. What that means is when culverts and bridges are destroyed by flooding, they will pay with their public assistance funding to put the right size upsize structure for, for years, the, the standard for that program was to put back in kind what was blown out. So if it was an undersized culvert, that's what FEMA would pay to put back. Now they have to meet our sizing criteria. So what does that mean? In addition to the trans hydraulic sizing criteria, they need to meet our geomorphic sizing criteria. Secretary Moore mentioned it earlier. Um, the key parameter there, there are a number of them, but is that bank full width, that natural channel width. That is a really important dimension. Because what that allows the, the crossing structure to do is pass sediment and debris, those things that will build up upstream of undersized structure and result in a catastrophic blowout. Additionally, coming out of the Irene legislative session, we were directed to set up a training program partnership with VTRANS and our Department of Fish and Wildlife. We stood up the rivers and roads training, multi-tiered training. We offered annually. Um, since 2012, we have run 860 individuals through 48 events as recently as last fall and spinning up this month with another set of, of trainings. And really the key takeaway there is that understanding and working with river processes improves flood resilience for those designing, constructing, repairing, replacing transportation infrastructure. And I guess I'll close with in-stream work and stream alterations to say that the increase in our jurisdiction that we got from Act 110 and 2010, the emergency authorities we got after Irene, Act 138, coupled with a broader knowledge base out there by practitioners and designers of how to work in rivers has made a difference. Since Irene, we have not seen large scale dredging, um, damaging, unauthorized, indiscriminate dredging, nor have we had requests. There's still some drumbeat out there. The paradigm hasn't fully shifted. There's still folks that think dredging is a solution, but we are in a better place. We have made headway. Okay, I wanna to pivot to land uses now. So we're, we're getting out of the river channel and we're thinking about river bottom lands. We've made some incremental gains um, since 2008. Um, <coughs> In, in regulating flood hazard areas and river corridors. I'll find those in a second. Um, and we've tried to impart in, in a myriad patchwork of, of jurisdictional authorities a no adverse impact framework. No adverse impact framework is important. The National Flood Insurance Program, which is the basis of most town regulations, 90% of towns are involved. It's, it's an insurance program that's focused on reducing risk to insurable buildings. It's not looking at whether that new development in a floodplain is going to cause increased hazards to others. So no adverse impact looks at not only do we, how do we reduce risk or avoid risk for the new development, but will that new development increase flood elevations, flood velocities, will it exacerbate erosion? It's outside the coin, thinking about people that are already there. We don't want to make the situation worse. Um, just a little bit more time on the slide because these are terms that are defined in statute and in rule. Flood hazard area, that red blob you see on the map there, that is the FEMA mapped inundation flood hazard area, the regulatory floodplain. What's underwater during the 1% annual chance flood, the 100 year flood. 90% of towns regulate that at the minimum. 
as they participate in the flooding council. We have dialed up um, those standards um, through model bylaws for towns. They're, they're optional. We recommend that they dial up inundation standards for the flood hazard areas. And then in addition, um, we recommend that the towns regulate river corridors. River corridors are mapped by my program, by our agency, and we're directed to do so by Act 38. We've been doing so in a limited fashion prior um, to 2012. Um, and the river corridor is, it's not really showing just what's underwater under one particular flood event. It's really that meander space a river needs over time. That's minimum valley bottom space a river needs to meander to a road, deposit sediment, and to really come up with a least erosive slope. And it's like an important planning tool for siting and development. So let's quickly <coughs> walk through the patchwork of jurisdictions. Again, most land uses are still regulated by towns. 90% of towns are in the flood insurance program. Since 2008, when we started offering model bylaws with higher standards, 97 towns have adopted higher standards. The standards are variable. Sometimes they adopt everything we recommend. Sometimes they cherry pick. Um, of those 97, 29 towns are regulating town-wide river corridors as mapped by the agency. So managing the regulating for river and erosion and trying to keep new investments out of that meander space. Okay. Then we have Act 250, Criterion 1D. We look at the corridors and flood hazard areas. That state authority as well. Um, we have a procedure with embedded no adverse impact criteria, similar to the model bylaws. Um, we make regulatory recommendations to district commissions. We don't issue the permits. Um, they do, but we advise them based on development proposals. And then the last one, the newest one, is our state flood hazard area and river corridor rule. Came online in 2015, regulates a subset of activities that are exempt from municipal regulations, such as state buildings and facilities, required agricultural practices, et cetera. Um, and this is where we have our no adverse impact standards more formally codified, and our program issues permits uh, under this rule. As we were trying to embed in these various regulatory authorities the no, ad, in, no adverse impact framework, um, we had to come up with a river corridor map um, to serve that, since that's a key, um, key priority for us, it's managing for river dynamics. So we published uh, in 2015 a statewide river corridor map layer. It's available online on the ANR Natural Resources Atlas. It covers about 14,000 miles of river and stream. That's significant. The maps to date cover about 20% of our, of our river miles, um, whereas our river corridor mapping is close to 75%. And again, an important planning tool, a regulatory tool to avoid really risky development in dynamic river valleys. And lastly, I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight quickly the, the non regulatory work of my team, um, river scientists that provide myriad partners technical assistance on river restoration floodplain restoration projects conservation easement work etc um, as a segue uh, perhaps to vem when they get to come up and present um, one of the best projects in recent years as secretary moore highlighted are done with a combination of hazard mitigation dollars and clean water funds to do buyouts to reconnect river channels to floodplains, to plant riparian trees, upsize culverts, et cetera. Um, our oft-repeated oft statement is what's good for flood resilience and flood mitigation <laughs> is good for water quality and vice versa. With that, I'll leave it there. I think you want to move on instead of ask questions. <laughs> um, do folks have, we could maybe see if there's time for one or two yeah. if folks have a question. Rep who? Rep Burke. Oh. Had a oh, that's right. Ma uh, Representative Burke, you had a question that was for the floodplain, for Rob, Mr. Evans, about the Waterbury floodplain. Uh, Waterbury question. About that floodplain. Is that ever going to be a possibility? It, it, it's really up to the landowner. Uh -huh. um, I was involved with some of that, including hiring a consultant that did the work to evaluate the Winooski and Waterbury. And the thought was the Winooski Street Bridge was backing water up through the village. Um, the consultant found that just downstream, 
railroad embankment is on one side is a key property where reconnecting floodplain can lower flood elevations, as you perhaps all heard. And that project doesn't happen without the landowner's permission. Um, but it speaks, I think, to a bigger question that should be considered, which is if we're valuing for broader societal benefit, floodplain function, lowering <coughs> flood elevations, storing flood waters, how do we how do we pay for that in a way that really accounts for all of those ecosystem services and broader societal benefits. Maybe if uh, the pot was a little sweeter for that landowner, maybe they would say yes. I don't know. I'm just speculating. Thank you so much and for your um, great work. Uh, and I, with apologies to Stephanie Smith and Marion Waltz, we will find time to hear from you. And sorry about the miscommunication around how much time there was. We are going to take a no, we're not going to break. Five minute break. Oh, we're going to transition. Yeah, right, we, so I think we'll have time for let's take yeah, so four take, minute break. Take a bio break, but we're going to transition. And this, it's really just a transition because we want to, It's we know we know people's tummies start rumbling and they want to wiggle. So if you have to get up and move around, um, please do. But we're going to invite the folks from VTrans to come up. And I think um, while, we're, while we're in this transition. So why don't we pause the stream, the live stream. Um, 